We have no saved Gentiles in chapter 4. No saved Gentiles in chapter 5. None in chapter 6. None in chapter 7. In fact, in chapter 7 we have Stephen preaching to Israel, to the Sanhedrin, and offering the kingdom. The church is not being preached. The body is not known. The gospel of grace is not being proclaimed. They are still under the kingdom economy, still under the kingdom message, still under the kingdom commission, and still offering the kingdom to Israel. But Israel's answer in Acts 7 is a final and total answer in that they stoned Stephen to death. And Stephen testified in his dying testimony that the nation had resisted the Holy Ghost. That they had stiffened their necks, that they were uncircumcised in heart, that they had in reality not rejected him, but rejected the testimony and offer of the Holy Ghost himself. Then we find things happening. In chapter 8, we still have no saved Gentiles. We explained this morning the Samaritans were not Gentiles, they were Jews. The eunuch was not a Gentile, although he was by nature, but he was a proselyte. He had been to Jerusalem to keep the feast. He was a student of the Old Testament scriptures. He had been proselyte to Judaism and was in the sight of God as Jew. Chapter 8 ends without a single saved Gentile. Hence the body could not have been a reality. Chapter 9 opens with the introduction of Saul of Tarsus. Saul on Damascus Road makes a wonderful discovery. First of all, that Jesus of Nazareth was truly the Christ, the Messiah prophesied by the prophets of old, and that he was alive, and that he was the right hand, and that in persecuting Stephen, he'd been persecuting Jesus, for Jesus had sent him. And Jesus had said that unless you receive the one I send, you've rejected me too. And then he learned, secondly, that Jesus had chosen him beforehand to be a special messenger, not to Israel, but to the Gentiles. And that Christ was going to send him to the Gentiles with the message of the remission of sin. Now in chapter 9 ends, we have Peter, who was chief of the Jewish apostles, up at Joppa, on the shores of the Mediterranean, in the province of Judea, preaching to the Jews the kingdom message, just as he preached it on the day of Pentecost. And then we have the account of chapter 10. Now I'd like to call your special attention to the 10th chapter of the book of Acts. First of all, a comment on the fact that the story of Peter and Cornelius is the most detailed account in the entire Acts of the apostles of anything that happened in the apostolic era. Three times the vision of Cornelius is narrated. Two times Peter's vision is told thoroughly. And two more times in the New Testament it is mentioned or referred to. Hence there are at least seven specific narrations or accounts of the happenings to Peter and Cornelius in his house at Caesarea. I don't think it's by chance that the Holy Spirit labored the incident of Peter and Cornelius. It is because it is a turning point in the dealings of God with people. There is about to be a change, a manifested change in the program of God. There is about to be a new message introduced. A new dispensation to begin. The kingdom is to be set aside and the age of grace is to begin. The message of the gospel of grace is about to be made known through Paul. For to Paul it was revealed and not to Peter. So the tenth chapter of Acts opens with the apostle Peter of Joppa. I'm not going to read, but I'll try and keep you up on the verses as we go along. Peter is at Simon the Tanner's house for the sea. 
And about the sixth hour, he goes up on the housetop to pray. While he's up on the housetop praying, he becomes very hungry and would have eaten. And while he's getting the meal ready, he fell into a trance, and this is what he saw in his vision. He saw heaven open, and he saw that a certain vessel, verse 11, descended to him, and it had a great sheet, or it was a great sheet, knitted to four corners, and it was let down to the earth, and in this sheet were all manner of four-footed beasts of the earth and wild beasts and creeping things and fowls of the air. And a horse came to Peter and said, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. I want you to keep in mind that Peter was hungry. Very hungry. But instead of responding to this invitation to eat, Peter says, Not so, Lord. He was a Jew, and the beasts that were in the sheep were animals that had been declared by the Mosaic law to be unclean for the Jew. There were certain animals that could not be eaten by the Jews. They were declared unclean. And in the sheep were unclean animals. Animals that no Jew would touch. Animals that no Jew would eat a bit of flesh. When Peter saw what kind of animals they were, he said, No, no unclean thing has ever passed my lips or entered my mouth. I wouldn't touch these animals at all, even though I'm very hungry. I could never eat these, for they're unclean. I like the answer that came from heaven. And the answer was, What God hath cleansed, that call not thou common. And this was done thrice. And then the vessel was received up again into heaven. Meanwhile, back at Caesarea, which was clear up on the coast north of Joppa, there was a Gentile centurion. He was an army officer, head over the Italian band, or cohort, or group of soldiers. And this Gentile army officer was a man that feared God. He was a good man as far as being a Gentile was concerned. And he did everything that he knew to please God, although he was not a proselyte. He was not a proselyte. There may be many reasons why he was not a proselyte. But I'm positive that he wasn't a proselyte because when Peter came back to Jerusalem, the Jews accused him of eating with one who was uncircumcised. And had Cornelius been a proselyte, he would have been circumcised. He was not a proselyte, hence he was a true Gentile, uncircumcised, alien from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers to the covenants of promise, with no promise of God whatever for salvation. And this Cornelius had a vision too. It was about the ninth hour of the day that an angel of God came to him and said, Cornelius. And when he looked up, he was afraid, and he said, What is it, Lord? And then the angel told him that his prayers and his alms had come up as a memorial, a poor memorial before God. And these instructions were given to him, Go down to Joppa at the house of Simon the Tanner, and there you'll find one whose name is Peter, you send for him, and he shall tell thee what thou oughtest to do. So while Cornelius is on the way, or his servants are on the way, rather, to call Peter, Peter goes up on the rooftop to pray. And there's so many practical lessons for this, you can hardly stay with the doctrinal part of it. One of the great practical lessons I find in this is the blessed way that Peter was led of the Holy Spirit. What the Holy Spirit was about to reveal to Peter on the rooftop knocked his doctrine into a cocked hat. But he went doubting nothing, for the Spirit said to him, I said these men. I like the way Peter's led of the Holy Spirit, and I like the way Peter is prepared and advanced by the Holy Spirit. And you know, if we gave ourselves to prayer perhaps more often, as Peter did at the sixth hour, it might be that we would be prepared in advance more often than we really are for the things that are about to happen.
the most special things are about to take place in our life. I think it is the blessed ministry of the Holy Spirit to prepare us ahead of time. And he was ready to prepare Peter in the word of God. For Peter had to have some word from heaven, else he never would have gone to Cornelius' house. And here was Peter, he went up to pray, and while he was praying, he became very hungry, but he fell into the trance. Meanwhile, if you can vision this, Cornelius' soldiers are tramping their way down to Joppa. And here's old Peter innocently on the rooftop praying, falling into a trance, and suddenly he sees, whether with his actual eyes or whether he sees with the eyes of faith. Remember, he was in a trance, and this was a spiritual vision. But he saw, behold, this great sheep which came down. And Peter and Donnelly marveled at these unclean animals in there and the temptation which apparently came from heaven to eat. Now, God tempts no man. But here was a voice right out of heaven telling Peter to go ahead and break the law of Moses. And Peter says, not so wrong. He wouldn't even break the law if God told him to. That's how zealous he was for the law of Moses. But the Lord said to him three times, what I call clean, don't you call unclean. Which is his way of saying that which has been unclean up until now is no longer unclean. It's now clean. Rise, Peter, kill and eat. Take your fill of the Gentiles now, Peter. Receive to yourself the Gentiles. They are no longer unclean. That was the message God was trying to get across to Peter. They are now clean. So, here is Peter. And the Bible says that he was much perplexed over this. It's obvious that he didn't fully understand it because of the fact that once he went through with it, he went back on what he said he believed and quit eating with the uncircumcised again. He didn't fully understand it. He was much perplexed. He couldn't figure out what this meant. What was God trying to tell him? What was God trying to say to him? And while he was thinking about this, the Spirit in verse 19 said unto him, Behold, three men seek thee. While the Spirit said this to him, they were standing outside the gate. Isn't that wonderful? Here's Peter up on the rooftop. He didn't have any way of knowing, but the Spirit said to him, There's three men looking for him. Arise, therefore, and get thee down, and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent it. So Peter went down, verse 21, to the men which were sent unto him from Cornelius. This is an interesting thing. I don't know if you ever just read that it's not. But he doesn't say, Whom do you seek? Or he doesn't open the door and say, What do you want? We're looking for Peter. Oh, well, I'm Peter. He didn't go that. He apparently went to the door, opened the door, and said, I'm the man you're looking for. If I been one of those three men, I'd just keel over back. First of all, I would have said, How do you know I'm looking for any of us? I might be selling four brushes. Secondly, how do you know you're the one I'm looking for? Peter opens the door and says, I'm the man you're looking for. What do you want? They said, well, well, it's Cornelius. This Cornelius, he's had this vision. And he's been warned from God by a holy angel to send for you and to hear words of thee. Hear words of thee. Now remember, first of all, that in our first record of Cornelius' vision, we're told that Peter is going to tell them what they ought to do. Now the men say that Peter is to give them certain words. And in verse 33, when Cornelius himself tells it, he says that the Lord told him that he was to hear all things that are commanded Peter of God. So when Peter heard this, he brought the people in and kept them because it was a long journey up to Joppa, or up to Caesarea. And so they lodged there. And the next day, after they got rested up, Peter got his suitcase packed. They all took off for Caesarea the next morning. And certain brethren from Joppa, now these were Jews, but we read in the further account of this that they were of the circumcision which had accompanied him. So these Jewish brethren said, we better go with Peter. See what this is all about. 
So they all started out together, and as they arrived in Caesarea and at Cornelius' house, Cornelius ran out and met him, fell down, began to worship him. Peter said, don't do this, I'm only a man just like you, worship God. And he said to him, you know that it's an unlawful thing for a man that's a Jew, verse 28, to keep company or come into one of another nation and try to establish soundly that these men were Gentiles. But God hath chosen me that I should not call any man common or unclean. Now Peter had progressed this much in the vision. He realized that the beast represented man. And that what was now clean in the sight of God was not particularly beast, although he did learn that later too. But what he discovered was that men were no longer unclean in the sight of God. That Jew and Gentile alike were now acceptable to God by the basis of the message that was to be preached. Peter did understand that the Gentiles were clean when he went to Caesarea. For as he stood there looking upon this group of Gentiles, the first thing he said was to apologize for his being there. He said, you know, it isn't right for me to be here. It isn't lawful for me to be here. But God has shown me that there isn't any man that's common or ever pleading. Therefore, I came to you without arguments. Soon as I was sent for, now I ask you, what do you want? He gets right to the point, doesn't he? Cornelius said, well, four days ago I was fasting until his hour. The ninth hour I prayed. He goes on to tell about the angel that visited him and what the angel told him and how he said, send for Peter. And now, therefore, verse 33, are we all here present before God to hear all things that are commanded thee of God? Now, in this account, you'll notice very carefully that Peter opened his mouth, and I'm going to read this. I want you to read very carefully with me exactly what happened. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. But in every nation, he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. The word which God sent unto the children of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all, that word, I say, ye know, which was published throughout all Judea, and began from Galilee, after the baptism which John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. And we, referring to we apostles, we are witnesses of all things which he did both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they slew and hanged on a tree. Him God raised up the third day and showed him openly, not to all the people, but unto witnesses chosen before God, even to us, who did eat and drink with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us, he's referring to the Jewish apostles, to preach unto the people and to testify that it is he which was ordained of God to be the judge of the quick and dead. To him gave all the prophets witness that through his name whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sin. Now stop right there and don't turn the page and you're still feeling about it. I first of all want to call your attention to the message that Peter preached. We have repeatedly said in these messages, and we must hammer it home again, that the gospel of grace was revealed to Paul. The gospel of grace was not preached at Cornelius' house. It's impossible to find the gospel of grace in Peter's message. The principle of the body was demonstrated at Caesarea through Peter, but Peter himself did not know what was about to happen. And Peter himself had no different message than he ever had. 
And this, to me, is one of the great miracles that happened in Cornelius' house. That something happened that knocked the props right out from under Peter, and everybody that was with him, because it was totally unexpected. Here is all Peter knows when he gets to such a risk, that God somehow has made the Gentiles clean. And when he gets there, Cornelius assures him that God told him that he was to preach to Cornelius all the words he had received from God. Now, was that the gospel of grace? Certainly not. And what does Peter begin to preach? Why well, he begins to preach the exact same thing that he preached on the day of Pentecost. And he starts out by telling how God sent this word to the children of Israel. And he begins by mentioning the baptism of John, which he preached. And he starts right out preaching nothing but the Jewish kingdom message to Cornelius. You say, why would he preach that to the Gentile? I don't know, except it's the only message he has. And he was there to preach all the words he'd received from God, and God had said it was all right to tell it to the Gentiles. And so he starts out telling them the only message that he knew. He's preaching the same message he preached on the day of Pentecost, but the Spirit of God interrupts his message. He was called there to tell these Gentiles what they ought to do and to give them words. And later when he goes back to Jerusalem, he says that he now realizes he went there to tell them words whereby they and their house would be what? Saved. Now I ask you, if somebody called you to their house and said, God has revealed to us that you know how to be saved, and we've called you here and commanded you to tell us everything the Lord has told you about how to be saved, what message would you preach? You'd preach the same message you've been preaching. You wouldn't break out a new one, would you? Well, neither did Peter, because he didn't have a new one. And uh, you can uh, accept this or reject it. It won't hurt your score on the test any. But I got a sneaking suspicion that if the Holy Spirit hadn't interrupted Peter, he was just about at the place where he was warmed up to talk about baptism. Because he had already approached the subject of the remission of sins. And he was talking about those who believed in Jesus would receive the remission of sins. And he was way ahead of himself on Joel's prophecy about the time when whosoever should call upon the name of the Lord would be saved. But before he can ever say a thing about repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and then you'll receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, he doesn't get that far. That's what he preached on Pentecost. That's what he preached in other places in the book of Acts. That was the message that he made known, and that was the means of the remission of sins. And he mentions it in his message, for he touches on the baptism of John, which he preached. And he said, you know what this message is. It starts way back there when John first began to preach his baptism. And he begins to unfold how Jesus was really the Messiah. And how he came with miraculous signs and power attending his ministry. And he gets down to talking about the remission of sins through Jesus. But before he can tell them how to have their sins remitted, a remarkable thing happened without any warning whatever to Peter or anybody else. The Holy Ghost fell on all of them who heard the word. If you'll turn over now to verse 44. I think verse 44 is conclusive evidence that Peter never finished his message. He was interrupted. You see what it says? While Peter yet spake these words, the words about the remission of sins, for anyone who believed in Jesus was still in his mouth. And he was like some preachers today. I'm positive. He was about ready to tell them how to have your sins forgiven and how what it really means to believe. That means getting baptized in water and repent. But before he can say a word, like he said on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit fell upon those who heard the word. Now you have it. Oh, I imagine you could have scraped Peter's eyes off of the stage. He can't deny that these people have received the Holy Spirit. An unsaved people.
people don't receive the Holy Spirit. But these people receive the Holy Spirit without water baptism. And without even hearing about it, with the exception of the brief mention of John's baptism. There apparently is not the repentance on water baptism there is on the day of Pentecost. Yet these people instantaneously, by faith, received not only the Spirit of God, they received the remission of sin. And the Jews that were with Peter, they were astonished. Their eyes popped open, they looked around. And they saw that this thing was very real. They heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. And they were astonished because of one thing, that on the Gentiles, God had also poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. And... <laughs> Peter answered like a true preacher. Can any man forbid water? You know, <laughs> it's the awful embarrassing to one of these camel eyed preachers to have somebody get saved before he got in the water hole. <laughs> They'd have to baptize him anyway, in spite of anything. They'd just have to. They'd say, let's hurry up and put him under before somebody finds out he got saved before he got in the water. And here's Peter saying, Well, what are we going to do? Let's baptize him. We'll finish this thing up. I'm going to leave it to you. As to whether Peter said what he should have said or not. All I know is that I would have felt awful foolish standing there hearing these people glorify God and testifying in the power of the Holy Spirit. What do you think they were testifying to? Bless your hearts, I'll tell you what they were testifying to. Something they had wanted for a long time. The remission of sins. They were simply telling how God saved them. And how their sins had been taken away by faith in Jesus. And they were so dumb. They didn't know they were supposed to wait until they got to the baptism bar. They just went ahead and got saved anyway. It's terrible because that's what Peter's preaching. It's dead. And I like this little ministerial conference I had. It's really good. What are we going to do with these people? Peter said, well, what else? Go baptize them. <laughs> what does any preacher do with converts when he gets them? We've got to baptize them. Well, do you read and hear where it says he really did baptize them? No, I don't either. I don't say he didn't. I just ask you if it's in there. Next time anybody ever tells you that, that Peter baptized Cornelius in his whole house, you ask him for the book, chapter, and verse. He told me I'll be. And I, I wonder what kind of nerdman he is. Now, you people ought to be baptized in water right away. All this baptism, how you spell his baptism. What's it for? We have the Holy Spirit. Did you ever think that what a contrast this is to Acts 2.38? Peter told the Jews on the day of Pentecost that they couldn't have the Holy Spirit without repentance and baptism and water. And they apparently didn't get him until they were baptized in water either. He told the Jews they couldn't receive the Holy Spirit. They couldn't be saved. They couldn't have the remission of sins until they repented and received that same baptism which John preached. And when they got that, they got the remission of sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. But at the Cornelius' house, they got it all without the water baptism. Doesn't it indicate to you that something has happened in the program of God? And doesn't it indicate to you that things are going to be different from this point on in the book of Acts? And doesn't it indicate to you that it is possible that this is the very first existence of the true body of Christ? And I'm not going to say, because I don't feel that I can say. All I know is this. The book of Acts is a transition book, where we find that we are passing from the kingdom dispensation to the dispensation of grace. All I'm sure of is that we start out in the book of Acts in the kingdom dispensation with the kingdom message 
and the king's apostles. I'm positive that we start out with repentance and remission of sins, or repentance and baptism in water for the remission of sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. And I'm positive that we have no Gentiles who enter into salvation until Acts 9 or 10. But I'm positive of this, that somewhere along the line, beginning at least with Acts 10, there is a complete transition, and when the book of Acts closes, we hear no more about the apostles. And we hear no more about the king. And we hear no more about the king. And we hear no more about John's baptism. And we hear no more about repent and be baptized in water for the remission of sin and the gift of the Holy Ghost that we do hear through the following epistles that the remission of sin is now by faith in Christ and is unto all them which believe and that the remission of sin is now by simple faith, not through works of righteousness which we have done. And yet John himself heard Jesus say that baptism, his baptism in water was a work of righteousness, which he must fulfill. But Titus 3, 5 says this is not by works of righteousness which we have done. And according to his mercy has he saved us. We don't hear any more about Jerusalem. And we don't hear any more about Peter. And we don't hear any more about the kingdom and nothing more about the Jews and nothing more about the king and nothing more about this message. But we do hear about Antioch. And we do hear about the Gentiles. And we do hear about Paul. And we do hear about the gospel which he calls my gospel and defines it as the gospel of the grace of God which was taught to him by direct revelation of Jesus Christ. And that message was recognized by the apostles of Jerusalem in Acts chapter 15. And they gave to Paul, after years and years, the right hand of fellowship and recognized his calling to Christ and the authenticity of his message. Now this I know too. When Peter got finished up there at Cornelius' house, he went back down to Jerusalem. And when he got back down to Jerusalem, we have it in Acts 11, the apostles, that's the rest of the twelve, and the brethren that were in Judea, heard that the Gentiles had received the word of God. Do you think that was big news? It was front page stuff. It shot Jerusalem to its foundation. Something is wrong. The Gentiles were not supposed to be saved until Israel was present. And they were down at Jerusalem laboring over the nation, and they heard that some Gentiles had been saved up at Cornelius' house. So when Peter came back down to Jerusalem, you can bet that they, they contended with him. And they called him in and they said, Look here, Peter, you jumped out of our commission and you jumped a gun, and you went up there, and you begin to eat with people who are uncircumcised, and you know that's not lawful for us. Were they still under the law? Well, of course they were. But they could never have quibbled over eating with uncircumcised people. It wasn't lawful. Were they still under the law? Certainly it was, or Peter wouldn't have quibbled over eating unclean meat. Paul thought in his epistles that all meat was good and fit to be eaten by believers. For it was sanctified by the word of God in prayer. There wasn't anything unclean, not even in the meat line anymore, for believers. But Peter didn't know that when he went up on the house top there at Joppa. He was still under the law. He was still under the law. The apostles in Jerusalem in Acts 11 were still under the law. Because they had never heard the message of grace. And they hadn't heard a thing about the body of Christ. And they hadn't heard a thing about the dispensation of grace because this was revealed to Paul. And when Peter gave his testimony, he just simply said like this, Brethren, I can't explain it either. All I know is God assured me it was all right. And he told them about his vision. And all these apostles could do was say, the only conclusion I can say or come to is this. That God has also, to the Gentiles, granted repentance unto life. We don't understand it. It sure throws a knot in the program. And it sure mixes us up. But that's what happened. Now, meanwhile, back at the ranch, 
what has happened to the Apostle Paul? Now, that's a good question, isn't it? Where has the Apostle Paul been all of this time? Well, without laboring these points too much, let me say that the Apostle Paul, saved on Damascus Road, was sent into the city of Damascus for three days, and there he was met by Ananias, and Ananias restored through the power of Christ his vision, and he baptized him. What commission was Ananias working under? And what commission was Paul saved under? He baptized him, told him that Christ had assured him that he had been called and chosen vessel, and Paul immediately began in Damascus to preach. What message was he preaching? Well, he was not preaching the gospel of grace. He didn't learn the gospel of grace on Damascus Road. He learned that Jesus was truly Messiah. He learned that Christ was King. And he learned that he was alive, not dead, that he was at the right hand. He went right into the synagogue and he began to preach to the Jews and preach that Jesus was the Christ. He was pretty hard to deal with, too. And they just couldn't stand up and saw here was this brilliant rabbi proving that Jesus was the Christ of the Scriptures. And then, as far as I can learn, he departed from Damascus and he went into Arabia. And I'm not going to be dogmatic about these points because I think the points that you can't be dogmatic about. But it is apparent that when he came back from Damascus, he had learned some things that he did not know previous to his trip to Damascus. And some things had been revealed to him that had never been revealed to any man before. And when he came back from Damascus, it was almost immediately after he had testified in Jerusalem and in the area about Jerusalem, that he went back to uh, Cilicia and Syria, where he was raised, and he began to preach in his hometown and surrounding area. But it was almost immediately that he began to make known and to unfold not only the gospel of grace, but the dispensation of grace. Now, I can't prove this, but I don't find anything to disprove that it is very likely and highly probable that at the same time Peter was on the rooftop in Joppa learning that a new dispensation was about to begin and that Gentiles were now to be saved, that Paul was in Arabia learning the same thing. The only difference was Paul understood it and <laughs> Peter didn't. And the only difference is that Peter was chosen to demonstrate it, but Paul was chosen to preach it. Peter didn't make it known. He didn't preach the gospel of grace. He didn't preach the dispensation of grace. He didn't know a thing about it. He didn't preach the body of Christ. It was a bigger shock to Peter than it was to Cornelius. Peter was just standing there with his mouth open when it all happened. But Paul was learning why it was happening. And that the kingdom had now been set aside. And that not just Jews were going to be saved, that God was now going to take out a church of Jew and Gentile who, by the Holy Spirit's baptism, would be placed into the very body of the Lord Jesus Christ. And made bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh. This is what Paul was learning. Now let's go on with the story before we come back to what Paul learned. We will do that in a little time. In Acts 11, verse 19, that's where we are in the story. Some of the people that were scattered abroad because of the persecution that rose over Stephen went as far as Phoenix and Cyprus and, the Greek, and Antioch, and the Greek says, talking the word to none but unto the Jews also. Or only, Jews only. And some of them were men of Cyprus and Cyrene, which, when they were come to Antioch, spake unto the Grecians. Now there are times when the word Grecian means the Hellenistic Jews. In this regard, it means the Greeks themselves. Antioch was a Gentile city. It was as Greek as any city could ever be. 
And the Grecians who heard for the first time the preaching of the Lord Jesus were Gentiles. Well, how did the men from Cyprus and Sidon and Venus, or Cyprus and Cyrene, how did they know that the Gentiles could hear? Well, I imagine the same way that Peter knew it. How did Peter know it? Well, the Holy Spirit told him. And anyway, when they get to Antioch, they find that they are now, and here's a new word not used before, evangelizing the Greeks. And the first thing you know, some of these Greeks believe, notice verse 21 doesn't say anything about baptism, but it does say that some of these Greeks believed and turned to the Lord, and down at Jerusalem they heard about it. Now, should this have been important news to the people of Jerusalem? Not really. Jews were hearing the message of the kingdom all over the place. But here was something unusual, front page again. Some Gentiles and Antioch had believed and were saved. Barnabas, it sounds like the same thing that happened at Cornelius' house. And you better go up there and find out what has happened. Now this is an interesting thing. I'm glad they chose Barnabas because it is said of him in Acts 6 that he was a good man and full of the Holy Ghost. That's about as good a qualifications and recommendations a man ever should have. A good man and full of the Holy Ghost. So old Barnabas trucks on up to Antioch and notice in verse 23 that when he came, when he came, and had seen what? The grace of God. You know, I took the trouble to check this out. It's the first time in the New Testament that the word grace is used in regards or in connection to the gospel or anybody getting saved. It speaks a couple of times in earlier chapters in Acts of sustaining grace, grace that was upon the apostles to help them and sustain them in their work. What kind of grace did Barnabas see there? Let me tell you what he saw. He saw saving grace. In other words, do you know what Barnabas discovered when he got to Antioch and began to interrogate these people and ask them what had happened? Well, I think very plainly and simply he found out that they had been saved by grace. I don't say they heard the gospel of grace. Please understand me. If this sounds confusing to you, you just have to bear with me. I did not say they heard the gospel of grace. Cornelius didn't hear it. I said they were saved by grace. Was Cornelius saved by grace? Oh, I should hope to tell you he was. He was just about as grace as a man could be. And so were the converts of Antioch, a strange breed, because others had repented and turned to water baptism, and it brought forth fruits meat for repentance. But these people in Antioch had received the remission of sins by sheer grace. No wonder they were a freak and a novelty. And the apostles of Jerusalem said, Barnabas running up there as hard as he could go to see if it was really true. And he looked, and he beheld, and I thank God, he didn't go up there and have somebody tell him about the grace of God. He saw it for himself. I like that, don't you? You know, the grace of God is Jesus. And when he went up to Antioch, he saw Christ in these people. <laughs> they were unorthodox. They didn't get saved the way they were supposed to. And they didn't do what they were supposed to do, but they had Christ. He saw the grace of God. It's the first time in the New Testament that grace is connected with the gospel or with people getting saved. Saving grace was what Barnabas discovered there. Now, what did Barnabas say? Oh, I'm sorry, you Gentiles always got saved. No, he said he was glad. And it's the word in the Greek for joy. Oh, Barnabas was filled with joy. Don't you imagine he was? He didn't understand, he didn't care. And I've seen people get saved in the most unorthodox way, haven't you? <laughs> Their testimony didn't sound right. They didn't use the right words. But you can see the grace of God in their lives. And you knew that they had the remission of sin. And you knew that they had Christ. They didn't use our phrases. They couldn't describe it in the terminology that we use. They may have gone to mourner's bench. I don't know what they did. They tell it in some of the strangest ways sometimes. 
bless your hearts wherever you see the grace of God. You've got to be glad. Aren't you glad? Third of joy. I don't care how they get it. As long as they get it. I don't care where they get it. As long as they get it. I don't care who tells them about it as long as somebody tells them about it. I don't care what Barnabas was hard. He was a good man. He was full of the Holy Ghost. He went up there and he said, I don't know what this racket's all about. I can't get a straightened out about the Jews and Gentiles. But that these people are saved that I can't deny. And when he filled out his report to be sent back to denominational headquarters, he just had to put on it and say, Dear brethren, I know it ain't according to the rules. But these people really got to say he's up there. But you know this Barnabas, he's a funny fellow. The apostle sent him up from Jerusalem to bring back a report. And he comes up, now follow this very carefully and you'll think. And he sees the grace of God in Antioch. And what does he do? Run back to Jerusalem and tell him about it? Oh, isn't that funny? <laughs> he, he jumps off the opposite direction and goes looking for Saul. Now, what would he do anything like that for? Saul, at this particular time, has no connection whatever with Jerusalem, does he? No. They don't even recognize Saul. In fact, he went down to Jerusalem and they wouldn't have anything to do with him. They were afraid of him. But here is Barnabas. Now listen, Barnabas was a good man and he was full of the Holy Ghost. And the Holy Ghost wouldn't let Barnabas go back to Jerusalem. And he wouldn't let Barnabas go back and bring those apostles up there. But he told them, you hold on to the Lord till I get back here with Saul. Well, that's what he said. He said he exhorted them to cleave to the Lord, didn't he? He said, you hold on to the Lord. There's a man i got to bring over here. Now, is the beginning to unfold a little bit? Why did he have to go after Saul? Well, in Acts chapter 9, let's go back here for a minute in verse 27. Now, this was after Paul had been in Arabia, after he apparently began to learn the gospel of grace that he went down to Jerusalem in verse 26, and when Saul was come to Jerusalem, he essayed to join himself to the disciples, but they were all afraid of him, and they believed not that he was a disciple. And who took him in? <laughs> Barnabas did, and guess what they talked about at night when they were sitting around the fire? The law? Hardly. What do you think Paul told Barnabas in those sessions they had at Jerusalem? I'm assuming something that isn't stated in the scriptures, but don't you think it's a fair assumption? Barnabas took him in. And Barnabas brought him to the apostles and spoke in favor of him and tried to give them his testimony and said how that he had met the Lord and how he had spoken to him, how the Lord had spoken to him. How he preached boldly at Damascus. He was giving him a ministerial recommendation. And so he tarried there for a little while and went in Mount Jerusalem. And he did visit Peter on that visit. He tells about it in the first chapter of Galatians. Isn't that significant? That the two people he talked with, had fellowship with, and dealt with on the first trip to Jerusalem was Peter and Barnabas. Why Peter? Well, they had some checking out here to do on what had happened up at Caesarea and what had now happened at Antioch. But listen, Barnabas, Barnabas knew Paul before Antioch happened. And it was after Paul had learned something about the gospel of grace. And Paul undoubtedly had done with Barnabas what all of us do when we get with a brother who loves the Lord and wants to talk about his word. They must have sat around and talked and Paul told him what he learned in Arabia. And as soon as Barnabas came up and saw what had happened in Antioch, it just rang a bell with him. And the Holy Spirit said, Listen, Barnabas, this is what Saul was telling you about down at Jerusalem. This is the grace of God. 
save men by grace. Paul has the message. Go to him. He can explain what's happened here in Antioch. So the Greek says in chapter 11, where it says in verse uh, 24, he was a good man, full of the Holy Ghost and of faith. He didn't have to have faith to do this because he might have got uh, his ordination taken away from him when he got back to Jerusalem. And of faith and much people was added to the Lord and then departed Barnabas to Tarsus. And the Greek says, to hunt up Saul. He went on a determined search of the Apostle Paul and he brought him back to Antioch. And it says that when he found him, he brought him back to Antioch and for a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and they taught much people. And another significant thing, the Christians were called, or the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. They'd never been called Christians any place else. I'm not going to try and put any interpretation on it. All I know is the Jews like to call them Nazarenes, and the Romans call them some names that aren't printed in the Bible. But the people in Antioch, which undoubtedly were the people who gave them this name, called them Christians. Now I ask you to answer a question which isn't answered here, but I think reason will answer it for you. Why did Barnabas go after Saul instead of going back to Jerusalem to get the other apostles? Because the other apostles didn't have the message or the teaching that people in the age of grace must have. Will you remember that point? These were people saved by grace. And people saved by grace need the teaching that Jesus gave Paul. That's the reason why he was single back in Jerusalem. Because he saw the grace of God in their lives and he knew if he went to Jerusalem, the apostles would get up there and teach them to be circumcised and teach them to keep the law. And they would take away from them the grace which God had given them. Not that they were bad men. They were good men. But they hadn't yet learned that a new dispensation had come to pass. And a new message had yet been given. So he went after Saul. Saul had the message of grace. And Saul had the teaching of grace. And apparently Barnabas had some of it too. Because when Saul got back, they sat down together and they taught these people in Antioch for a whole year. And you can bet your bottom dollar on this. They taught them the gospel of the grace of God. That's the reason why, dear brethren, the council in Jerusalem in Acts 15 was called. Because later, some teachers from Jerusalem came up to Antioch and tried to teach circumcision and law-keeping, and the Antioch people thought they were hearing a different gospel than they'd ever heard, for Paul had taught them grace. And it's so disturbing you know why he's serving? Because Peter came up there and went back on his former conviction and refused to eat with some of the Antioch Christians who were uncircumcised. And his testimony in Galatians 1, Paul's testimony tells me that there was a division caused in the church at Antioch over it. And so much disruption was brought about among the saints that they had to send Paul and Barnabas and some others down to Jerusalem and face the apostles once and for all and get straightened out whether we were still under the kingdom dispensation or had a new dispensation begun. Was the kingdom message still, still valid or was the message of grace valid? Are men to be circumcised and keep the law? Are they to live under kingdom teaching or are they to live under the grace of God? And the council answered it once and forever. It was grace all the way and they gave Paul the handshake of fellowship and told him they would continue to go to the Jews. And he must go now to the Gentiles, but they went, brother, with the same message this time. Now, let me ask this question. This is important, see, brethren, and the reason it's important, I hope you see the importance of it. Oh, it's so important. You know why it's important? Because you're going to be amazed when you begin to find out how much kingdom teaching has been applied in your life. 
And you're going to find out that yoke is just as heavy as it was when these people tried to carry it and couldn't carry it. And you're going to find out that maybe the very thing I'm preaching on that perhaps you thought was just a little boring, you may find out one of these days that the thing I'm preaching on tonight is the source of much frustration in your Christian life. Because you're trying to apply principles and rules that do not apply to the age of grace. You are living under a kingdom legalism in many areas of your life. And so am I. That is not for the age of grace at all. That's the reason why these principles don't ever work in your life. And you're ashamed to tell anybody publicly about it because you think they just don't work in your life. Those are the things we're going to discuss starting on Wednesday night. That's the reason I'm laboring over these messages. To lay this foundation because you must see this. That the age of grace has nothing to do with the kingdom age. That the rules and principles and teachings and legalism of the kingdom do not apply to us in the age of grace today. And if there is a teaching of the kingdom that is compatible with the teaching of the age of grace as revealed to Paul, fine. But wherever there is conflict, you better hear the man who was caught up into the third heaven and had revealed to him the message for the people of today. Now, there is a good question which arises in all of this thinking and discussion. Paul received a tremendous revelation. First of all, he received the gospel of grace, as we know it. He received the teaching of the body, as we know it. No other man had ever had it. Not even the prophets of all. He received the great truth about Gentile equality in that body. He received the great truth of the rapture. How the body one day would be caught away in the air to meet the Lord Jesus. He received the truth about the redemption of our physical bodies. So many precious truths were given for all. The question arises, did he receive it all at one given historical time? Or did he receive it in a series of revelations? That question has to be answered if you go very deep in your own thinking. Because if he received it all in one historic moment, then there has to be a clean-cut place in this book where the dispensation of the kingdom stopped and the dispensation of grace began, doesn't it? And I, I, I know that I, you're probably confused on some of these things, and I'm three no one trying to make a plan. And technically, there it is. For instance, the law was nailed to Calvary's cross, but it was a long time before anybody knew it. Because the kingdom was still being offered to Israel, and from all outward appearances, nothing had changed. And that's what Paul refers to as the mystery of the gospel of the cross. You never hear about the preaching of the cross till you read about Paul. The disciples didn't preach the cross. They preached the murder of Christ. Paul unfolded the mystery of that cross. About the law. About the body. About grace. If you want to say a technical place, yes, at the cross. We're sorry that this message is incomplete, but due to the length of the original tape, the last few minutes of this message could not be recorded.